in our Caesar cipher class, um, the way that the keyed Caesar cipher works is that when you specify the key phrase, think of it kind of like a password used for the encryption. Um, that key phrase is used for the which letters are substituted with which letters. In order for that to make any sense, um, in the key phrase, we can only specify a given letter once um, because we can't have like the letter B be substituted in two different ways. That wouldn't, wouldn't work. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to be kind to the user, though. We're going to let them type in any key phrase. Um, and we're going to let this class accept in a constructor later today any key phrase. And then we're going to compress that key phrase. We're going to write a method right now that gets rid of duplicate letters in the string so that it will work as a valid key phrase. Um, so we're going to write all of this in another method. And so we're going to scroll down to, actually, let's write the constructor first. I like that idea. So here we are at the top of the Caesar Cipher class. Here's our instance variable key phrase, um, which we want to make sure after we're done making a new Caesar Cipher object, uh, key phrase is initialized to a key phrase that has no duplicates. So we're going to write our own constructor for Caesar Cipher. Um, we want our constructor to be public because we want other classes to be able to make new Caesar Cipher objects. Remember, a constructor has no return type, not even void, and its name must match the name of the class exactly. This is not a default constructor. Rather, when the user creates a new Caesar Cipher object, we want them to actually specify the key phrase. So I'm going to create a single parameter of type string, and I'm going to call it initial key phrase, initial key phrase. Um, with that initial prefix that we're used to. So as I just explained, what we actually want to do here in the constructor is we want to prepare the key phrase, our instance variable here, by removing duplicate letters. We could type a whole bunch of code in here to do that. And that would be fine. Um, but Often when we have a, a bunch of logic performing a single function, it's useful to put it in its own method, okay? Particularly, I don't like it when my constructors get really long. I like them to be concise. If a lot of stuff needs to happen, I'd rather write another method to do it. We call this method decomposition. It's one of our computational thinking things. Um, I'd rather write a different method and then call the method from in the constructor. We've never done that before. So I wanna show you like what this looks like. In a constructor, we're used to just initializing instance variables, but we can totally call other methods in the same class, that's just fine. So I can call this new method that we're about to write called compress key phrase. And I can pass as the argument, initial key phrase. And as always, I, I want to call this method on a variable that references an object but we're in the middle of creating a new Caesar Cipher object. So what variable do I use? We use this. Call the compressed key phrase method on this Caesar Cipher object, the one we're literally constructing right now. Okay. This code won't compile until we go off and write the compressed key phrase method, which we'll do in just a moment. So, but I wanted to show you how in a constructor, it is totally reasonable and often done to call other methods in the same class. The only place in this code we're going to call compress key phrase is right here in the constructor. Our users or other people who are creating or using the Caesar Cipher class, they have no reason to call compress key phrase. Okay, it's 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 something internal to our class. So when we scroll down here to define this method, and let's do that after the method we wrote previously. Scroll, 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 there we go. So after that method and before the encrypt method, we can write the method header for this compressed key phrase. However, since this method is internal to this class and code in other classes have no reason to call it, instead of having public visibility, we're gonna give it private visibility. We're gonna make this a private method. By saying that no code other than code in this class can call this method, which is exactly what we want. 
Uh, the return type is void, doesn't return anything. We said it would be called compress key phrase and takes a single parameter of type string, which I'll name init key phrase. Because we're writing a new method, um, I want to write a little Java doc comment for like, what does this method do? This method compresses, compress the specified key phrase by removing all duplicate letters. It's not going to return anything because we're just going to update our instance variable, but it does take a single parameter called init key phrase. And that is the key phrase to compress. In this method, we're gonna explore several methods on the string class. All of these methods are also on your AP CSA quick reference. So these are part of, these are actually most of the methods we're responsible for knowing um, in terms of uh, the string class methods, uh, like for the AP exam. Before we jump into that, let's initialize our instance variable. So this dot key phrase, we're gonna initialize it to the empty string. Um, the empty string is, it's still a string object. It just has a length of zero. There are no characters in there, um, but this does result in making a new string object. We have a valid reference. We can call methods on key phrase. We're, we're good to go. It's just that there aren't any characters in it yet. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna build up this instance variable key phrase letter by letter by letter as we check for duplicates. Um, before we can do that, we need to figure out how long this thing is. So the first method we're going to learn is called length. The length method on the string class simply returns the number of characters in the string. Please note that I said number of characters, not like number of letters. Every character counts, whether it's a space, a tab, a new line, punctuation, a number, everything counts. All of those are characters. All of those contribute to the length of the string. So we'll create a local variable called key phrase length. We'll assign it uh, the value returned by calling the length method on the variable, the parameter variable, init key phrase. In my quest to have us write a somewhat interesting example here, um, as opposed to just like do a bunch of string methods on, I don't know, random names of fruits or something, um, we have to use a couple of concepts we're not gonna get to until our next unit. We need to write a loop so that we can look at each letter one at a time. So we're gonna write the code for that. If you're like, mm, this doesn't really make a lot of sense, that's totally to be expected we'll spend an entire chapter on looping structures. Um, but one way to write a loop that will help us go through every character um, in the string um, is by writing a for loop. And here's the Java syntax for that. We'll have a local variable i, which we initialize to zero. So we start counting at zero. We're gonna keep running this loop as long as i is less than this key phrase length that we just determined. And each time, every time through this loop, we're gonna increment i by one. i plus plus is the same as i plus equals one. Add one to i. And again, a whole chapter coming up on looping structures. So for now, we'll just kind of roll with it. Um, what I think is the most complicated method in the string class that we are responsible to understand um, is the substring method. Um, and there's for a couple reasons why I think um, it can be a little challenging. Uh, one of which is there's actually two versions of the substring method. And we're gonna look at each of those one at a time. 
Um, so let's look at the first version. So we're going to learn about the method substring. What this method does is it returns part of the string. It's called substring because it returns a subset of the string or a subset of the characters. So it returns part of the string starting at the first specified index. So we say where we want to start and it goes up to, but not including the second specified index. I just used the word index and I didn't explain what that means. So let's actually capture an example right here in the comment to make this a lot more concrete. Let's say for this variable, we have init key phrase. Let's suppose that the user typed in the string or, or the, its value rather is Caesar. Okay, the key phrase is Caesar. I'm gonna type the string Caesar with some extra spaces just to help us visualize each individual character. Um, but to be clear, it's just Caesar. There are no spaces in the string. And then below each letter, I'm going to add what we call the index for that character in the string. So when we are talking about indices, we start at zero. So the character at index zero is C, the character at index one is A, index two is E, index three is S, index four is another A, and index five is R. These numbers are what we refer to as indices. In many things in computer science, it's zero based in this, it's a zero based index. Okay, the first character is at index zero. We're gonna see this pattern repeat over and over again in Java. Um, good news, Python's the same way. So at least we're consistent. The length of this string, just to be clear, is the number of characters. One, two, three, four, five, six. The length is six. In fact, the length will always be one greater than the last valid index. The index of the last letter is five, the length is six. It will always be that way because we start counting at zero. We want to have a local variable of type string called letter. And what we want to assign to letter is just a single letter in this key phrase at whatever index i is. So the first time this loop runs, we want to have letter be assigned to the string c. The second time this loop runs, when i has a value of one, where we want letter to be a, and so on and so forth. And so the way we do that is on the variable init key phrase, we call the substring method. And the first parameter is the index that we want to start the substring at, which is gonna be i. And because we want a single letter, a single character, the second parameter is, is gonna go up to, but not including that. So we're gonna say i plus one. So for example, when i is zero, we're gonna pass the value of zero and one. So we're gonna start at index zero, which is the C. We're gonna go up to, but not including index one. So it's just gonna return the substring of the C. We don't have to just grab one string. If we wanted to grab three letters, we could say I plus three, and we get C, A, E all at the same time, okay? Um, but remember, we go up to, but not including the second index specified. Cool, so now we have a letter that we want to now, now we wanna search through the rest of the string to see if this letter appears in the rest of the string. If it does, it's a duplicate, and we're just gonna throw it out. If it doesn't, it means it's unique, and we're gonna add it to our actual key phrase, our compressed key phrase. So we need to basically, we need another variable that's gonna be the rest of the string. And to do that, we're gonna use the second version of substring. So here's the second version of substring. The second version of substring is different because it only takes one parameter. So if only one index is specified, this version of substring returns part of the string starting at the specified index through the end of the string. 
super convenient. And I'm gonna copy this example so like we can keep referring to it because it's gonna help us not get confused with our indices. So we'll create another local variable called rest of key phrase. And on the init key phrase variable, we're gonna call substring again, but this time we're only gonna pass one parameter. And we want that one parameter to be where we're gonna start the substring at. Um, and then we're gonna go through the rest of the string. So for example, when I is zero, we just grab the C. We want rest of key phrase to be A-E-S-A-R. So we wanna start at index one, or generally speaking, I plus one. So when I is zero, letter will be C, rest of key phrase will be A-E-S-A-R. Having this second version of substring is convenient. It's certainly not required. If it didn't exist, we'd be okay. Um, we could always write code like this instead. We could say init key phrase dot substring I plus one, and then we could we could just specify the length as the second parameter. This works um, because the length is six. So it's gonna start at index, let's say I is zero, zero plus one is one, start at index one, go up through, but not including index six, which is good. There's no character at index six. We'd still get A-E-S-A-R. But like, why type all this, right? It's easier to just use the second version of substring. So this is a rare example where Java makes our life a little bit easier, which is great. Speaking though of making our life easier, there's some things that Java doesn't support that may, you may be um, familiar with from Python. And substring in Java, does not support negative indexes, indices. Okay. So in Python, you can specify a negative index and it, it indexes from the end of the string backwards. So negative two is the second to last character. Java doesn't support this. It's okay, we can deal with this. It just takes a little bit more work. So for example, let's say we did want the second to last character. Instead of negative two, we would simply do the math to figure it out. And we would specify a knit key phrase dot length minus two. In this example, the length is six, six minus two is four. The character at index four is this A. Yeah, that's the second to last character. We can calculate the index starting from the front. So even though we don't have this feature, we, we can deal with it. It's not too bad. All right, we have progress. We have extracted a single letter. We have extracted a string of the rest of the key phrase. Now we need to do the search. We need to determine, is this letter somewhere in the rest of the key phrase? And the string method we use for that is called index of. Also on your APCSA quick reference. Index of returns the index of the start of the first occurrence, this is a lot of conditions, of the specified string. And I will certainly give you a couple examples of this. If we don't find the specified string, if not found, it returns negative one. So we're gonna be invoking the index of method on the string rest of key phrase, and we're gonna search for that letter. So in the comment, I want to capture rest of key phrase. And I know typing this in is pretty tedious. Rest of key phrase is A-E-S-A-R. Again, spaced out just to make it easier to read the indices. Start at index zero, one, two, three, four. Again, just to remember these are 
indices and the length is one, two, three, four, five, five. We're searching for a single character. Our string lateral letter has a single character, but to be clear with index of, we can search for an entire substring within the other substring. So here's like an example of that. If I were to say rest of key phrase <coughs> and pass in the string SA, that would return a value of two, okay? For this example, why is that? Well, here's the entire string. Does this string contain the string SA? It does right here. It has to have the whole string. It's gotta be a perfect match. SA occurs right here. If there were multiple occurrences of, of SA, we only focus on the first one. And the value that's returned is the start of the match. So it's not gonna return index three, which is the end of the match. It's gonna return index one, which is the start of the match for SA. That's how index of works. So we'll create a local variable called index of type in. And on rest of key phrase, we will call the index of method and we'll pass letter as the argument. So search for this letter in the rest of the key phrase. We don't actually care if we find a duplicate, we don't really care where it is. Um, we just know that if there is a duplicate, we can just ignore the letter for now and we'll wait until there's no longer a duplicate later. Um, so that's all we really have to check. Um, if there's not a duplicate, we want to concatenate the string letter to the end of our instance variable. We're gonna slowly letter by letter build up our, our key phrase. Um, so that requires string concatenation. And you all learned about string concatenation in the last chapter, last unit. But now we have um, some better language to describe it in. And I wanna show you a cool trick related to string concatenation, which will make more sense after um, what we learned about yesterday. So as a reminder, the plus symbol is the string concatenation operator. And we know a lot more about operators now and operands. So we can have a much more formal definition of string concatenation. String concatenation concatenates the second string operand to the end of the first string operand and returns a reference to the new string. Again, you already know this, you've applied this, you've practiced this. I'm just stating it more formally in terms of operators and operands. Here's the cool new thing. Yesterday we were focused on what happens when we have like the addition operator and one operand is an int and the other operand is a double, right? Well, what happens if we have the plus symbol and one operand is a string and the other operand is an int? Um, this is what Java does. If one or both, but the interesting case is if one. So if one or both operands are a string type, the plus symbol is the string concatenation operator. And so how do we deal with this? Um, much like we do with arithmetic promotion, Java will automatically um, operands are converted to string objects automatically by Java. Otherwise, if neither operator is a string, just to be clear, plus is the addition operator, as we would expect. But if just one operand is a string, Java is going to convert the other operand into a string for us automatically making a whole new string object and then concatenate them together. This is really, really convenient. 
And we use it sometimes, um, here's the trick. Sometimes we have a variable of type int, we need to convert it to a string, um, and we need a, a easy way to do that. There are multiple ways to do that. This is, in my opinion, the easiest. So if I have a variable like x equals int x equals seven, x is an int, we initialize it to seven. We now want to use it as a string, like quote seven. So we want to have another variable called x as string. Um, we can't just say this. This won't compile. It's going to say you can't assign an int to a string, and int isn't a string. Um, but here's how we work around it. We take advantage of this concatenation behavior. We use an empty string literal. This automatically makes a new string object. It's a new string object without any characters, but it's still a string object. And now that we have one operand, which is a string, the other operand will be automatically converted into a string object. The concatenation is then occurs, but it doesn't, this is an empty string, so it doesn't add anything to it. And after this code runs, X is string has a value of seven in quotes. Remember this little trick, it is so easy. Yes, there are other ways to do it. They tend to be more error prone. This is really simple. All right, that was a little bit of a tangent, but it was worth it because this is a, a super helpful trick. At this point, we have a letter. We have the rest of the string. We um, have just searched the rest of the string for that letter. If we didn't find that letter, then index of would have returned negative one. So we're gonna actually write an if statement. <clears throat> I know we're not gonna do this till the next unit either, and we'll have a whole chapter on conditions. But for now, we're just gonna say if index is equal to negative one, that's the syntax for saying that. All this line of code means is if the letter is not a duplicate, if that's the case, we'll say this dot key phrase, we're gonna update our instance variable key phrase by concatenating to the end this unique letter. Hoo hoo. Here's our string concatenation operator. In this case, they're both strings, but we're still using the string concatenation operator. Another little tip, some good news. Often when we're concatenating one string to the end of another string and storing the result back in that other string, much like we do with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, we can use the um, augmented operator, this dot key phrase plus equals letter. So this totally equivalent, I think it makes even more sense, up to you which one you wanna use, um, but this is valid for strings. So we did all of this work to decide if letter was a duplicate or not. If it's not, we concatenate it on the end of key phrase. We go back up to the top of all this code where I will now equal one and we look at the next letter, so on and so forth till we iterate through our entire string. <clears throat> 